So the psalm that uh, Tanner wanted me to read is Psalm 19. Unfortunately, it's not my favorite psalmist, Mr. Anonymous, but it's by David. So David's the author. And the theme is both God's creation and his word reveals his greatness. So Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their, where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. Yet it rises at the end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much more gold, much than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the mediation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. As many of you know, some of you more than others, uh, I'm an avid outdoorsman. And there's something that I continually hear in the outdoor industry. I really, I, I hear it echoed by hikers, hunters, fly fishermen, and really any outdoorsman. And it usually goes something like this. The mountains are my church. And what they mean by saying this is that they have no need for what their idea of church is, because they feel most emotionally tied to the Creator while out in His creation. Now, there are many theological errors that, that come from this way of thinking. One could discuss what the biblical definition of what a Christian is, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. One could discuss what biblical worship is, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, Colossians chapter 3, and verse 16. One could discuss the error in forsaking the assembly, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. One could discuss the error in not partaking of the Lord's Supper in accordance with Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. My point is, one could discuss a lot of errors that come from this way of thinking. But here we're, we're going to take a little bit of a different approach. We're going to kind of think outside the box on this. We're going to work at it out of Psalm 19. Here in Psalm 19, David speaks about the revelation of God. God revealed himself to man through two ways. That is, natural revelation being creation and, and the world outside, or direct revelation. God directly speaking to the prophets, or how we get it today, through the prophets' writings, through the scriptures. He discusses both of these here. Essentially what he does is he paints steps in knowing God. To begin here in verses 1 through 6, he talks about knowing God through his creation. He goes on then in verses 7 through 11 to go to the next step of knowing God. This is knowing God through his word and his law. He describes the testimony of God being sure, the commandments of God being pure, and the judgment of God being righteous and true. Notice here, this isn't where he stops. He doesn't stop in verse 11. He goes on in verses 12 through 14 to talk about the final step in knowing God. And this is knowing him and accepting him on a personal level. In verse 13, he says that he is God's servant. And in verse 14, he says that God is both his rock and his redeemer. Both of these statements are true if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ here today. So we'll begin, we'll, we'll start dissecting this, and I hope as we work through this, you're able to see the flow of thought that he paints. It reminds me of James chapter 4 and verse 8. Draw near unto him, and God will draw near unto you. 
And it's something that's kind of similar here. You know, we initially know God through creation. Next, we, we learn about God through the scriptures. But then the application of the scriptures is knowing God upon a personal level, a covenantal relationship if you want to bring it to baptism. So we begin in verses 1 through 6 where David writes, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and in their words to the ends of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, and its circuit to the other end. There is nothing hidden from its heat. In verses 1 through 6, David points the reader towards God's creation. It says that his creations declare his glory and his handiwork. And as I said, it is a mistake to equate creation with the church. But there is a sliver in truth in what they say. Creation truly is beautiful. It truly is magnificent. It truly is a blessing. And it reveals some aspects of God, though not entirely. The section is, is entirely centered around creation. Within the Old Testament, different names are given to God to highlight different attributes of him. Here in verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. Here David uses the word Elohim for God. This means the mighty one or the supreme one. It highlights God as creator. It's that attribute of God that he is pushing forward to the attention of the reader. And... Uh, I can't remember who did the scripture reading. I think it was Dale out of Genesis and was saying that, you know, you're probably not going to use Genesis in a sermon of Psalm 19. Well, here's some Genesis. This is the word that's used to, uh, words, it's the word that's used for God in the creation account in Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heaven and the earth. Or Genesis 1.27, So God, Elohim, created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So, this section is, is entirely centered around God as creator. So think of the world around us. Think of the intricacy of it. Think of how every single little thing functions in such a perfect way that we can continually exist and life can continually exist. For instance, think of uh, the ecosystem. The, the water cycle is a great example of this. You know, we, we understand that animals need fresh water to survive, just like us. They got to drink water. So God created the water cycle and such a way that there's a continual cycle of fresh water running to the animals that need it. Remember the rains come down, they go out to the ocean through the rivers, sun picks it up and it just continually goes over and over so that animals can continually have fresh water. It's almost like it was designed that way. It's almost like they need that. And beyond this, in the ecosystem, you know, everything is a, is a perfect balance. I'm coming at this from an outdoorsman point of view, but this is something you see, especially with what's called carrying capacities of the ecosystem. The eco ecosystem can only hold so many animals before eventually there's not enough food, right? So what God had implemented is a balancing nature to it. For instance, the predator and prey relationships within an area. As predators start to rise up, the prey start to drop because they're getting eaten, right? And then that makes the predators drop and the prey rise up. And, and it's just a continual balance. It's just a continual cycle uh, that just goes on without man's interference in it. I think this points to God's design before us. Uh, beyond this, think about you know stars and, and our universe and the laws of nature. There are many worlds and, and many stars, yet Earth is the perfect place for life to exist. They say that if laws of nature affected us any differently, if, if gravity affected us any differently, if we were slightly closer to the sun, we'd burn up. If we were slightly further away, we'd freeze to death. We are in the absolute perfect position in order to support life. And I think this points to God being the designer before it all. I don't think any of this happened by chance. I don't think it happened randomly. 
it points us to design. And, and beyond this, we also have beauty throughout it all. He also blessed us with beauty. Think of uh, uh, sunrise on a mountain morning. I say this in Texas. They don't know what I'm talking about. But you guys, I know you got it. A sunrise on a mountain morning. Think about how beautiful that is. Or think about a sunset over the place that you love. Think about the beauty of it. Think about the most beautiful landscape you've ever seen. David says here in verse 2, that day unto day utter speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. So when we examine the world ourselves and our universe, it points us to seeing the evidence of a designer before it all. Take this for example. This is oftentimes illustrated, you probably heard it before, with the watchmaker. A watch is designed. It points us to there being a designer. I'll use it with an iPad. I'll, I'll, I'll update the illustration. So this is an iPad. At its core, we have glass, we have components in the middle, uh, electricity, uh, an aluminum housing, and everything like that. If I were to take these pieces, if I were to take some glass, take some aluminum, take some you know, circuit board, something like that, put it into a box, I could shake that thing until my arms fell off, and I'm not going to get an iPad out of it, right? This iPad took someone thinking it through, it took someone designing it, it took someone creating it, it took someone making it, just like our world out there today. And Paul uses this core idea in Romans chapter 1. I understand that we went through Romans, I guess probably a year and a half ago at this point. But Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, Paul says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Romans chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. At its core, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop an educational word that I never thought I would ever use in a pulpit. I learned this at Brown Trail. It's called the teleological argument. And that's a big word, and it means absolutely nothing to nobody. It means the evidence of there being design in the universe. That's what it's talking about. And this is what David's pointing to in verses 1 through 6. So, therefore, my conclusion, those who say that nature is their church, they're, they're wrong, they're flawed, and ultimately they're in error. But nature is a great blessing to us. All created things display the love, glory, power of our Father. In nature, we can see some aspects of God, but we can't truly know Him. People who disregard the Creator for His creation will unfortunately be left with only that. Eternity will be infinitely greater than this world that we are in today, and to forsake eternity for the temporary is all too common and all too unfortunate as well. If we think about the most beautiful aspect of nature, Think about the most beautiful sunrise or the most beautiful sunset you've ever seen. That is going to pale in comparison to what the Christian sees on the other side of eternity. But you must be in Christ in order to achieve it. Therefore, to forsake eternity for the temporary is all too sad. David makes a transition, though, in verses 7 through 11. He talks about knowing God as the next step through direct revelation. This is through the scriptures. In verses 7 through 11, he says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Notice this out of verse 7. You're not going to really notice this out of English, but in the Hebrew, there's a name change that he's using for God. In verse 1, he was using Elohim to, uh, to emphasize God as being creator. Now he's made a transition over. He says the law of the Lord. He's using the tetragrammaton Yahweh in this case. And this is emphasizing God as the God of the covenant. He's saying the God of the covenant, Yahweh, the person who gave to us this law, the person who gave the promises to Abraham initially, is perfect, converting the soul. His testimony is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, and the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is 
great reward. So, to know the Creator through creation is the initial step in understanding God. But we can only learn so much about Him in this way. Can we learn who God really is? No. Can we learn who, who Jesus is? No. Can we learn what God demands from us? The simple answer is no. Can we learn how to be saved? No. The simple fact is, is that we need the scriptures. We need our Bibles. But natural revelation points us to the direct revelation. David here gives an in-depth description of God's word. In verses 7 and 8, he gives names of the word. In verse 7, he says it is law and testimony. In verse 8, it is statutes and commandments. But then he, he also goes ahead and he gives attributes of this word. In verse 7, it is perfect and sure. In verse 8, it is right and pure. In verse 10, it is more desirable than gold and sweeter than honey. We'll date David's life, date this roughly about 1,000 B.C depending on how you ask me a little bit after. During this time, you know, they couldn't go to Yoke Supermarket and go grab a bag of sugar, right? So the sweeteners they had of the time was honey and date honey. Here David is saying that the word of the Lord is sweeter than even that, sweeter than the sweetest thing available to him. And also he said it's more desirable, more desirable than gold. What more could a king want than gold? According to David, the word of God. Do we see our Bibles like that today? Do we see our scriptures as more desirable than gold? Do we see it as sweeter than the sweetest things available to us? Though that is poetically stated, do we view the scriptures the same way David does and the same way that we are intended to? So God's word is a perfect and true light unto our past. If you want to bring that to Psalm 119, uh, it, com it contains all that mankind needs. If you want to bring that to 1 Peter chapter 2. There's a saying that says, within the covers of the Bible are the answers for all the problems that men face, and I do find this to be true. But we also must understand that the Bible is so much more than just an instruction manual. It displays the immense love that the Father has for us. Really, it reveals God's plan of redemption for mankind. As mankind, we have separated ourselves from God because of our own sins. You see that in Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 through 2. In Genesis 3, we see the first sin. Mankind had introduced sin into the world and forever changed their relationship with God. Mankind was no longer in the garden. Mankind no longer walked and talked with God in the same manner. It forever changed the course of history. But also in Genesis chapter 3, you see the first promise of Jesus Christ. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God said to Satan, And I will put enmity between you and woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Immediately after man fell short, immediately after mankind chose sin and severed their relationship with God in the same manner, God gave the promise of Jesus Christ. God already had in his mind the redemption story of mankind that we see through our scriptures. This promise of the Messiah is later attached to Abraham. We see this initially in Genesis chapter 12. We see it echoed again in Genesis 15 and really fleshed out in Genesis chapter 2 very well. We have three promises of Abraham, remember? Land, nation, seed. Seed being Jesus Christ. Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, God said to Abraham, in your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. This is seed, it's singular. And here he is referring to Jesus Christ. And ultimately we understand that through Jesus Christ, all nations of this earth have been blessed and have the ability to be blessed. And we ourselves have the ability to be blessed as well. And in case you, you think I'm interpreting this wrong, this is what Paul said in Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one. And to your seed, that is Jesus Christ. So there, Paul is making reference back over to the seed promise, making reference back over to Genesis chapter 22, 18, by telling these Judaizing teachers, it's not the nation of Israel he's talking about. 
He's talking about Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, the best commentaries on the Bible, if we really want to figure out what they're talking about, is the scripture itself. Here's an example of that. And as we work through the rest of the Old Testament, the prophets conclude with Malachi. God essentially tells him, the forerunner is coming and I will follow him. The Old Testament essentially ends in saying, this is extremely paraphrased, Jesus is coming soon. And so, after this, 400 years of silence fell upon Israel. And they understood this. They had not seen a prophet, and then all of a sudden, guess who came on the scene? John the Baptist. John the Baptist came. He prepared the way. He came out of the wilderness, compelling men to repent. And then guess who followed him? God incarnate, Jesus Christ came, dwelt among us, and was crucified, bearing the sins of the world, being our scapegoat and being our complete sacrifice. Finally establishing the opportunity for a restoration that we initially severed in Genesis chapter 3. He's fixed the relationship so we can have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Genesis chapter 3, we see it change, we see it severed. But then beyond this, we, through our own personal sins, have separated ourselves from the Father. Once again, in reference to Isaiah 59, 1 through 2. At some point in our lives, we were given an opportunity to sin. We were not born with it, as some believe. No. We were offered an opportunity, and we made a choice, and we chose wrong. When we chose to sin, we separated ourselves from the Father and put ourselves on a crash course bound for eternal judgment. Yet, through Christ's blood, through being buried into his death through baptism, we can have our sins remissed in accordance with Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Acts 22, verse 16, Galatians 3, 27, 1 Peter 3, 21, and Mark 16, 16. It is through baptism. And so therefore, God's plan worked, and it's revealed to us, and it shows the wisdom, love, power, and deep empathy that God has for us. So, the, word, uh, the world reveals some aspects of God, but the scriptures reveal the rest. They reveal the wisdom, love, and power of God, as I said. But this isn't where he stops. Look at verses 12 through 14 with me. Where there David writes, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. This is the final step in knowing God. It's knowing God on a personal level. It's being his servant. It's knowing him as your rock and your redeemer. To know God through nature is a step. To know God through the scriptures is the next step. But one cannot simply know about God or simply know God scholarly. One must have a relationship with God that shows itself through knowledge, love, reverence, and labor before him. Oftentimes, people pass off this idea of simply knowing God scholarly as something that's reserved for the higher-ups in, in Bible programs or Bible institutes or preaching schools. Unfortunately, that's not true. Too often today, people simply know God through the scriptures or know about God through the scriptures. They know him as words on a page rather than truly knowing God as the Father. And this affects all aspects of life. It's the difference between a God-centered life versus someone who merely goes through the motions. It's the difference between someone who simply darkens the door on a Sunday morning and warms a pew versus sees this as an opportunity that God has granted us to edify one another, worship him, and evangelize those who are not in Christ. And so I ask you, are we here merely waiting on the doors to open and for this preacher to shut his mouth, or are we here taking advantage of the opportunity that God has granted to us? To simply go through the motions shows a lack of reverence before God and therefore a lack of appreciation for the sacrifice that Jesus Christ paid on our behalf. 
verses 12 through 13, David indicates his reverence for God and point to his own shortcomings. Really, in, in verses 12 and 13, it's an examination. In verse 12, David says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me of my secret faults. Here, the Hebrew word sathar is being used. It means hidden or concealed. So are these sins that he is hiding from God? Is he concealing them from God? Or are they rather sins that are hidden from him? Sins that he doesn't understand that he's doing. Sins that he's doing out of ignorance. I think the latter is true because in verse 13 we see a contrast. Here David asked to be cleansed of the sins that he doesn't even know he's done. When is the last time that we have done that? Verse 13, he goes on to contrast it. He says, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Presumptuous, the Hebrew word zed is being used. It means done out of arrogance, pride, the idea of knowing, and yet continuing in the sin anyway. Now, we see these outlined in the New Testament as well. Uh, Works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21 are a great example of this. Sins that are just blatantly against God and yet continued in. Uh, in Galatians 5, 18 through 21, Paul wrote, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, pay attention to each word, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which, basically him saying, etc. I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Ultimately, these are sins that are done out of arrogance. They're done out of pride. They're blatantly against God, yet continued in them. And, and Paul writes here that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We see that these are salvational issues before us. David said, let these sins not have dominion over me, and therefore we must do the same as well. We must carry ourselves with the same mentality that David had in our relationship with God. But, you know, people often talk about a relationship with God. What does that actually mean? Is it, as some outsiders say, a, a warm, fuzzy feeling you feel in your heart? Is that it? Or is that yesterday's lunch coming up? I, I don't think that's what it looks like. I think this is what it looks like, or at least as the scriptures reveal it to us. The beginning of a relationship with God begins with reverence. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, it's written, The fear of the Lord, the respect, the reverence of the Lord, is the beginning of knowledge. And then once we, we have this reverence and, and we have this respect for God's word and we grow in our knowledge, then we learn the error of our ways. And therefore, this reverence, this respect for God, leads to us changing our minds followed by a change in action. That's repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 9 through 10, Paul wrote, Now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that sorrow led you to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10. So therefore, after this repentance happens, after this reverence happens, you obey the gospel. You obey the words of the Bible, and therefore, you have your sins remiss. And this leads to love and gratitude for the forgiveness that, Jesus, or that God showed to us. In Psalm 8, verses 3 through 4, the psalmist wrote, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars with which you have ordained, what is man that you thought of him? Who are we that Christ would die for us? Genesis chapter 3. Mankind made a decision to go against God blatantly. Beyond that, we all did on our own personal levels. We separated ourselves from him. We were bound for judgment. 
who are we that God would put together thousands and thousands of years of prophets, miracles, and providence in order to bring about someone to save us from our own wrongdoings? Who are we that he would do that for us? Who am I that Jesus Christ would go upon the cross, bear my sins, so that I, through his blood, may have redemption of sins? And the same is true for all of us. It leads me to love for Jesus Christ, and it leads me to love for God. This love then leads to bearing fruit and labor for Christ. This can take the form of literal servitude. Uh, I'd go back to Matthew chapter 20, verses 20, 26 through 28. That shows this. Uh, but it also leads to keeping commandments and fleeing from presumptuous sins and avoiding ignorance as well. In Psalm 1, 1 through 6, the psalmist wrote, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bring forth its fruit in season, whose leaves shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff with which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the ungodly shall perish. So therefore I say to you, as it said in, Matthew, in Psalm 12 through 14 here, Psalm 19, 12 through 14, we must have a relationship with God. And I think this relationship looks like and reveals itself in reverence, repentance, gratitude, love, and labor. So, in the psalm, David speaks about the revelation of God. Through these revelations, one may draw closer to the Father. Initially, we see his amazing handiwork through creation. We then learn his attributes through the scriptures. Then we personally know him by adhering to standards and entering into a covenantal relationship with him that we have revealed to us through baptism. To simply know God through creation or scholarship is not enough. So I beg you to come to revere God. I beg you to live your life in the light as the scriptures demand us to. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. And I beg you to show gratitude to the Father through labor and worship. And I beg you to not forget why we are here today. Once again, I, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the continual support that you all have shown to me. Uh, words cannot describe how much you guys mean to me. You guys are on my thoughts, on my heart, and in my prayers often. So how much I love you guys. Um, at this time, if you are not a Christian, if you have not been baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins in accordance with what the scriptures teach, uh, then I offer you the opportunity to come up and, and learn further about it. Or if, if you're a Christian that perhaps has fallen short, perhaps you're only seeing God as words on a page, and you want to change that, if there's any way I can help you, if I can pray for you, I invite you to come forward while we stand and while we sing. Why do you wait?